Hello and welcome to our third online study session. This is for MIT 1033 and my name is Diana. I will be hosting today's online study session. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Forsythe isn't able to attend today. She is in Washington to uh, do Easter egg hunt with um, President Obama. So I thought that was might, uh, more important than helping me out today, but I hope we can still manage ourselves. So before we start, I see a few attendees already online. I want to make sure that they can hear me. So if you look in uh, um, on your screen, you might have a little box where you have a couple of uh, functions or options that you can do to communicate with me. Um, if you can hear me, please raise your hand so I know that we can start. All right, very well. You guys are on top of it, then quick. I'm going to put your hands back down. So with the uh, text box, it's going to be really difficult today because I am by myself. All right, somebody keeps on raising their hand. Okay, so what we're going to do is, so I know that you guys have questions, um, just raise your hand and then I will check the text box if you uh, um, typed a message for me or have any questions so I can respond to that because it's really difficult for me to see both screens at the same time but I will be able to see if you have your hand raised so that's a way to get my attention. Okay so I think we are ready to start with our first question. <clears throat> Let me see. There we go. So our first question for test three is find the domain of the rational function and write the answer in set, builder, and interval notation. So basically right here, this is a rational function. Let me just grab a color pen real quick. And when they ask us to find the domain, what we're basically looking for is the value or values that would make the denominator of this fraction undefined because as you know when you have a fraction and there's a zero in, denomin in the denominator then the fraction would be uh, undefined. So to find this value we basically just taking the uh, denominator which is x squared minus 36 and setting it equal to zero. That helps us to find this value that will make the denominator zero so our fraction would be undefined. Well, this is a factoring problem and we did factoring very heavily in the um, past, on the past uh, test. So um, you should realize that this is the difference of two perfect squares and to factor the difference of two perfect squares you write an x and an x. You need a negative and a positive sign and it doesn't matter where which one goes. I'm just going to start with my negative and then my positive and then the square root of 36 is 6 and 6. All that is equal to 0. Now we're taking each individual part and setting it equal to 0. So x minus 6 is equal to 0 and also x plus 6 is equal to 0. Solving for x on this side, we have to add 6 to both sides. That cancels out the 6 on the left side. We got x and 0 plus 6 is 6. And now on the right side, we will have to subtract 6 from both sides and x is by itself negative 6. Okay, so we found those two values that will make our denominator equal to 0 and give our fraction an undefined uh, value. To write this in set builder notation, and I believe on the test I made it a little bit easy because I gave you this part already. So x, the line means such that x is a real number a real number and so now the two values are going to go there that make the denominator undefined so x cannot be equal to negative 6 
and x cannot be equal to 6. Okay, so this would be set builder notation and now an interval notation basically on the number line if you have a number line and those two values would be on there so let's assume here is negative 6 and in the middle we have 0 and then on the right side we have positive 6 so these two values are not included in uh, our solution and in interval notation we're basically reading the graph from the left so this is our negative and this is our positive and we're starting at negative infinity and basically the dark shading, I didn't use a different color, but I hope you can see, starts at negative infinity and it goes all the way up to negative 6, but negative 6 is not included, so we're using parentheses, and then we're using the union symbol, and then it starts again at negative 6, but negative 6 is not included, so parentheses, it goes all the way to 6, but 6 is not included and then we have the union so now it starts at 6 again, 6 is not included so parentheses and it goes all the way to positive infinity so that would be an interval notation I see somebody raised their hand so let me just check my uh, chat box real quick um, I don't see any questions, so I guess that person just um, tuned in a little late. I was saying that I'm going to be by myself today, so uh, if you have a question and type something for me into the chat box and raise your hand, so I see you put your hand down, but only raise your hand if, if you type something into the chat box so I will be able to check what you wrote or what questions you have. All right, so if there are no questions for problem number one, then let's move on to question two. And question two says, evaluate the rational equation for the given value. Okay, so we have f of x equals x minus 5 over 2x plus 6, and the given value would be f of negative 1. So usually you see you have f of x, so now when you have a negative 1 in place of the x, that means nothing else that the x value is equal to negative 1. So we're going to use our function and plugging in a negative 1 for every x value in this function. So negative five, a negative 1 minus 5 over 2 times negative 1 and then plus 6. I know this is a different way of uh, writing it. Now we're not using y anymore. All this is from back in the days the value y. Now we're using a more uh, fancy notation calling it f of x. But we do not have to solve the left side. It stays like that. It just reminds us that we plugged in negative 1 for x. So the only thing we have to do is solving the right side of this function. So negative 1 minus 5 gives me negative 6. And then 2 times negative 1 would be negative 2 plus 6. And now we can keep on simplifying the bottom. So negative 2 minus, I mean negative 2 plus 6 is 4 and we can reduce this fraction even more because the numerator and the denominator are both divisible by 2 so dividing both by 2 we get negative 3 over 2 and that should be our answer for this question all right I give you guys a few seconds to see if you have questions on evaluating rational equations Okay, nobody's raising their hand. Let's move on. Question number three. So this one says, simplify the rational expression. Okay, so if I'm looking at these two parts separately, right away 
I feel like trying to factor it. So I'm going to try to factor the numerator and I'm using the method of pulling out the greatest common factor. So 5x minus 25, both of them share a common factor of 5. And when I divide both terms by 5, I'm left with x minus 5. So the numerator is in factored form. Now the denominator also has a greatest common factor. And the greatest common factor is 7. Pulling out a 7 from both terms, I'm left with 5 minus x. So now you might be tempted to cross these two out because they look alike, but actually they are not the same. So we only can cross out um, parts from the numerator and the denominator if they are exactly the same. So either you remember that if they are reversed, all that happens is that in the front gets a negative added. And to see why, let's do it here on the side. So I'm going to take this bottom part and I'm going to reverse it. So this is the same. I could also write it like this. And now I can pull out a negative. That gives me x minus 5. Because if I multiply this negative back in, I'm getting exactly the negative x plus 5. So now, as you see, they are the same. And I got this negative that I was mentioned before. So the negative, I'm just going to write it in front. And then I have x minus 5. And now also the denominator has x minus 5. Now when they are exactly the same, that's when I'm able to cross this out. Okay, I guess it makes sense. If there are no questions, then I'm going to move on to the next one. So remember, you can only cross out common terms if they are exactly the same. If they are not, then you have to try to manipulate them like I did over here to make them exactly the same. Okay, so question number four. Divide the rational expression. In this case, especially when we have a, a division sign, and basically you can see these as two fractions, we have a method that we can use, and that is called keep the first one, change the sign to multiplication, and flip the second fraction. So I'm going to do just that. And I'm keeping the first fraction. I am changing the sign to multiplication. And then I am going to flip the second fraction. And we do that because we have no idea how to actually divide fractions. But um, keeping, changing, flipping helps us to convert it into multiplication and we do know how to multiply fractions. So again, this looks like factoring and I'm going to start right up here with this one. So I have a trinomial, three terms and there is a coefficient of one, which means an imaginary one in front of the z-squared. So I can use what I call my Colombian method because a friend of mine from Colombia has taught me this method and I really like it because it 100% gives me the correct answer. So with this method, I am writing my two empty sets of parentheses. Then I'm going to square root this first term. So I get a z and a z. I'm going to bring down my first sign, which is a plus, And then I'm multiplying the two signs together to give me the second sign. So a positive times a positive is also a positive. And now I'm going to find the factors of this last number. If I have the same signs in here, same signs, then the factors must add to give me the middle number. 
So in this case, 4. The only two factors of 4 that will add to give me 4 are 2 and 2. Well, if they are not the same, usually I am supposed to write the, the greater of those two factors first and then I don't have to worry about the signs. But in this case, because these factors are the same, it doesn't matter. So I'm done factoring the first part, moving on to the denominator. So I got z squared minus 25. These are two terms and both of them are perfect squares. So I can use the difference of two squares to factor this. We did that in the previous problem, so we write our empty set. We split the z into z and z. We split the 25, basically we take the square root of 25, which is 5 and 5, and then we just need a positive and a negative, or a negative and a positive, doesn't matter. Just opposite signs. And we're done with that. Now let's move on to the numerator of the second fraction. So we have z squared plus 5z, and what I see is that the only thing I can do uh, pulling out the greatest common factor. Both of them share a z. So taking out a z, I'm left with z plus 5. And then the denominator, basically I can do nothing. It's already in simplest form. So I'm just going to bring it down. Now, I could also connect my fraction bar here because this is a multiplication and then I can cross out anything from on top with anything in the bottom, but they have to be the same. So I'm going to start right here with z plus 2 and z plus 2 top and bottom and then also I can cancel out the z plus 5 in the bottom and the z plus 5 on top. Okay, multiplying together what we have left so z times this z plus 2 and then in the bottom I am just going to have z minus 5 and in this case it's fine to leave it like that but if you wanted to and on your test both of the answers are going to be correct. Either you leave it like that or you are actually getting rid of this parentheses and distributing the z back inside. So you will get z squared plus 2z over z minus 5. So both of these answers are correct. Okay. Let me know if there are questions. Then let's go to the next one, which is question number five, and it says add or subtract the rational expression. Okay, so right here, now we are moving on to uh, subtracting and adding rational expressions, and the same like with fractions, you need the same common denominator. But in this case, as you can see, all of these are the same. So when they are the same, we can just add or subtract together the numerators. But in this case, they are not like terms. So we are just going to write them next to each other. But now all of them have the same denominator, which was m minus 6. To see if we can simplify even further, I noticed that the numerator might be a factoring problem. So let's try to factor this. This is a trinomial with a coefficient of 1, so there's the imaginary 1. I'm using my Columbian method, so I'm writing my empty sets, square rooting this first term. So the square root of m squared is just m and m bringing down my first sign, multiplying my signs together. So negative times positive is a negative to give me the second sign and then finding the factors of the last number, so 24. Remember same signs you have to add 
different sign, subtract, to give you the middle term, and in this case, 10. So you don't need to use any signs, just the plain numbers, if you're following those rules. So now the factors of 24 that will add to give me 10 is 6 times 4. 6 times 4 is 24, and 6 plus 4 is 10. So in this case now we have two different factors, so make sure always to write the larger of those two factors first, in this case 6, and then the smaller one second. Now in the denominator I had m minus 6, so as you can tell I can cross out the m minus 6 from top and bottom. So the only thing I'm left with is m minus 4 as my final answer. Okay, moving on to the next question, question number six. This one says perform the indicated operation and simplify if possible. So we are still dealing with adding and subtracting of rational expressions, but in this case we do not have the same common denominator. To be able to find the least common denominator of both of these fractions, we have to simplify these denominators a little bit by using factoring. So let me factor the first one, the x squared minus 16, and uh, these are, this is two terms, and both of them are perfect squares, so this is a difference of two perfect squares and you can factor that by splitting the x, taking the square root of 16, which is 4 and 4, and then just a negative and a plus sign, so opposite signs. So we're done with that, and let's see our second fraction. Again, this is a trinomial with a coefficient of 1, so my favorite method, square rooting the first term, I get an x and an x, bringing down the first sign, a plus, multiplying the signs together, also a plus, finding the factors of 4, same signs, that will add to give me the middle number, which is 5, and the only factors of 4 that will add to give me 5 is 4 times 1 which is 4, and 4 plus 1 is 5. Larger one first, smaller one second, and I'm done. Okay, so now I can compare them, and I see that both of these already have x plus 4. But then I notice that this one has x plus 1, and this one has x plus 4, which are different. So basically, the least common denominator of all these um, pieces together would be a combination of all. So least common denominator, both of them have an x plus 4, so that's definitely going to be part of the denominator. And then one of them has x minus 4, and the other one has x plus 1. So that's what I was meaning by saying a combination of both. So now they have all of them. So what I have to do now, and let me change my color real quick, I will have to multiply the left side by what is missing in the denominator. So on the left side we are missing the x plus 1. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by x plus 1. And then on the right side, what I'm missing is the x minus 4. So I'm going to multiply the right side by what is missing, the x minus 4. Okay. So in the next step, you basically just have to put all this together. So I'm going to distribute the x plus 1 with the x. So I can rewrite it too. Usually you have the x in front and then the x plus 1. So this might look nicer and easier for you. 
to distribute, so x times x is x squared, and then x times 1 is just 1x, or just x. And then on the second side, I'm going to distribute the 3. So either you're going to put it inside parentheses here, or you're going to remember that it's not just a 3, that the negative goes with the 3. So I'm going to use parentheses and then do it in the next step. But either way, you get the same answer. Just don't forget about this negative sign. This is really important. That will change your final answer if you ignore that. So 3 times x is 3x, and then 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. Now, both of them have the same common denominator, so I only have to write it once. x plus 1, x minus 4, and x plus 4. <clears throat> so this is what I meant. Now I have to distribute the negative sign. And I am going to get x squared plus x and then minus 3x. A negative times a negative is a positive 12. The denominator stays the same. And x plus 4. In the numerator, I see both of these terms are like terms. So I can combine them and I am going to get x squared and then 1 minus 3 is a negative 2x plus 12 and x plus 1 x minus 4 and x plus 4 so this looks like a trinomial, so I should try to factor it. But I did this problem previously. And, well, let me show you how you figure out that you cannot factor it. So with a trinomial, you're supposed to use any method of your choice, the AC, Colombian, or trial and error, or any other method there is. So in my case, I'm going to try to use the Colombian method. And that's why I also like this method, because I would know if a trinomial is not factorable. So I would take my first sign, multiply the signs together, and now I'm supposed to find the factors of the last number, which is 12. Again, same signs here, so the factors must add to give me the middle number, which is 2. So can you think of any factors of 12 that will add to give me 2? I cannot, and therefore this trinomial is not factorable. So that would actually be our final answer. And in um, on your review online or on your test, you do not need to foil the denominator back together. It is fine to leave it like that in the binomial version. Okay, let me know if you have questions. No hands up, so let's move on to number seven. And number seven says simplify the complex fraction. So I guess on this test we're dealing a lot with fractions. But it's not too scary if you know what to do, if you have a good method. So if you have a complex fraction, the method that I prefer is to uh, um, eliminate those fractions in between. So what you have, or clear the fractions, what you have to do is find the least common denominator of those individual fractions. And in this case, because both of them have the same denominator, the least common denominator would just be that, which is x. So what we're going to do is 
let me change my color again we're going to multiply each part, and I hope you can see that there are four parts, right here, 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 and here. So each part by the least common denominator. So we're going to multiply the 8 times the x, the 7 over x by x, the 64x by x, and the 49 over x also by x. Now, we multiply all this back together and if we did it correctly we should have gotten rid of those complex fractions and just have a simple fraction. So 8 times x is just 8x and then over here trying to multiply this I can put this over 1 and if you're familiar with cross-canceling fractions you should notice that the x in the denominator and the x in the numerator cancel each other out so all I'm left with is just 7. In the bottom I have x times 64x and I'm getting 64x squared. And then over here the same happens like on top the x in the bottom and the x on top cancel out so we are left with just 49. Again, we always need to check if we can simplify even further. And if I'm looking at this bottom part, I'm thinking about factoring again. And I see the, two, the difference of two perfect squares, because 64 is a perfect square and 49. So I'm going to use that method. So numerator stays the same, but then in the bottom, factoring the difference of two squares. So the square root of this first term is... 8x, 8x, then uh, the square root of 49 is 7 and 7, and I just need opposite signs. So now I can actually cross out the 8x plus 7 on top and the 8x plus 7 in the bottom. So on top, I'm not left with a 0, I'm actually left with a 1. And then my denominator is 8x minus 7. So that is my simplified form of this complex fraction. The steps are usually the same. The only thing that might change is the fraction and the numbers. So try to study the steps rather than memorizing how to solve this particular problem. Okay, so let's move on. Question number eight. And question number eight says, solve the rational equation and check your solution or solutions. Sometimes you have multiple solutions depending on the problem. So let's see what we got here. We got 29 over x equals 6 minus 1 over x. So we can also use the method of clearing the fraction by multiplying everything, every single term, by the least common denominator. In this case, because both of the denominators are the same, our least common denominator would be x. So we're going to multiply each term like we did in the previous problem, by the least common denominator. So the 29 times x, the 6 times x, and the 1 over x times x. Rewriting the problem by multiplying everything together. Again, as you can tell, the numerator and the denominator are cancelling out and we are left with 29. Then over here, nothing to cancel out, so we're actually multiplying 6x together. And then the last part, also the numerator and the denominator cancel each other out and we are left with minus 1. So now there are no more fractions, and this is basically just solving an equation for x. You should be able to know what to do, 
So getting x by itself, I'm going to start by adding 1 to both sides. And this gives me 30 equal to 6x. And then dividing both sides by 6, this leaves me with 5 equals x. Or just reversing it, x equals 5. Okay, so with these types of problems, and especially when it says check, that should be a hint that you may have extraneous answers, answers that does not work out and do not give you a correct answer. So you should go back and try to plug in your, your answer into the original um, equation to see if you get a true statement. So taking the original equation and plugging in 5 for x, I'm getting 29 over 5 equals 6 minus 1 over 5. So I'm not supposed to move nothing around. I'm going to have to solve each side separately. So the 29 over 5, I cannot simplify that any further. And I don't feel like uh, converting it into a mixed number or a decimal. So I'm just going to leave it like that. And over here, I'm going to subtract these two. I can either use my graphing calculator and then convert it back into a fraction, or I'm just going to do it um, manually. So if I do it manually, I need the same common denominator, which in this case is 5. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by 5. That gives me 30 over 5. It's not 51, it's 5 times 1. OK, and then minus 1 over 5. Now 29 over 5 stays the same. And on the right side, you can actually subtract the numerators now. I also get 29 over 5. So this checks out, this is a true statement, which means that x actually equals 5, and 5 is a solution to this equation. If you happen to come up in a problem where you don't get a true statement at this step when you're checking, then you have no solution, even though you got a value. But if it doesn't check out, your answer should be no solution. Next question, question number nine. Okay, I also wanted to mention if you don't feel comfortable asking questions meanwhile we're recording, I will, after I stop the recording at the end of this session, I will stay on a little bit longer if you have any questions then I also be able to answer your question privately without other people listen to it. Okay, so if you have questions, make sure you write them down if you don't want to share them with the group and ask me after the study session. All right, so question number nine. It says solve the rational equation and check your solution or solutions. So basically this one is similar to the previous one, so we're going to use the same method we are going to multiply by the least common denominator and in this case it's easy there's only one denominator so it should be m so the next step was to multiply each term by that least common denominator so we're going to multiply m by m the negative 5 over m by m and also the 4 by m Let's rewrite this, and we are going to get m times m, which is m squared, and then numerator and denominator cancel each other out, so we are left with negative 5, and over here 4 times m is 4m. Okay, so to find a solution to this problem, especially when we have a score involved, we should probably try to use factoring, and to factor an equation, we have to set that equation equal to 0. So we are going to move the 4m to the other side by subtracting 4m from both sides. And then we are going to write the terms in descending order, so starting with the m squared, then the minus 4m, 
and then minus 5. All that is equal to 0. So they are not like terms. I cannot combine them. I am writing them next to each other. So now let's try to factor this. This is a trinomial with a coefficient of 1. So let's use my, factor in, uh, my favorite Columbia method. We are square rooting the first term, which gives us an m and an m. Then we're going to bring down the first sign, which is a negative. And now finally, I'm going to show you guys what happens when there are different signs, because a negative times a negative is a positive. So we find the factors of this last number without signs of 5. And now those two factors, because here are different signs, those two factors have to subtract different signs. You subtract to give you the middle number, in this case 4. So the factors of 5 that will subtract to give me 4 is 5 minus 1. The larger of the two factors first, and I don't have to worry about my signs 100%, they will always work out. So now I'm going to set each individual part equal to 0 to find my solutions. m minus 5 is equal to 0, and also m plus 1 is equal to 0. Solving for m, we get adding 5 to both sides, so m equals 5. And over here, subtracting 1 from both sides, so m is equal to negative 1. It says check, so we better do check. Let me make some room here. And we're going to check by taking the values and plugging them back into our original equation. Let me write the equation down. I kind of messed it up a little bit, so it's hard to see. So I believe this was the original equation, and now I'm going to plug in my 5 first. So 5 minus 5 over 5 is equal to 4. 5 over 5 is nothing else than 1 is equal to 4. And 5 minus 1 is 4 is equal to 4. So this checks out. This is a valid solution. And now let's try to plug in negative 1. So negative 1 minus 5 over negative 1 is equal to 4. And then negative 1, we can combine these two signs. So a negative divided by a negative gives me a positive and that is equal to 4, and then negative 1 plus 5 is 4 is equal to 4. So both of these answers check out, which means negative 1 and 5 are my two solutions. And I believe, just to make sure that you understand on the um, review and test, you would have to type them in, separating them with a comma. It doesn't matter in which order, Usually it is preferred or mathematically is preferred to write the smaller number first, but it would look something like that. So make sure you read the instructions of every single question. But also I'm going to go through it manually to see if somebody messed up by um, typing in something that might still be correct. It's really hard to create math uh, questions with an electronic system, so I hope you, uh, you know, you can put that aside and still do well. Okay, so if there are no questions on this problem, we move on to 10. This one says, solve the literal equation for the specified variable. A lot of students have a very, very hard time with this question. Um, I always say just focus on that one particular letter, in this case Q, we're solving for Q, and don't get too caught up with the other letters, just do the steps. So solving for Q. Q is right here. So my first step would be that I'm going to move this other term away from the Q to the other side. I'm going to subtract 1 over P from both sides. 
Now on this side, it's gone. I'm left with 1 over Q. And on the right side, I'm just writing these two next to each other. Now Q is not in the numerator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by Q to get Q in the numerator. On this side, I will cancel out. I'm left with 1. And I am not going to distribute it because that would mean that I'm splitting the Q. Then it will happen to be twice here, but I don't need it twice. I only need it once because I'm solving for it. Um, let me just write this real quick. But what I'm going to do is, because I need Q alone, and right now this is multiplication, I'm going to divide by this on both sides. So I'm going to divide by 1 over F and 1 over P by the whole thing, because the whole thing is multiplied by Q. But I have to do it to both sides. Minus 1 over P. And then on this side, the numerator and the denominator cancel out. So now Q is by itself. But on this side, I have a complex fraction. And if you guys remember what we did when we have complex fractions, we multiply by the least common denominator. And in this case, the least common denominator would be a combination of the both denominators. So my LCD is basically FP or PF. Again, in mathematically right would be in the order of the alphabet. So um, P, I believe, no, F comes first. <laughs> well, I don't know my ABC now. Um, so I guess F comes f first. Unless you guys disagree, you can um, raise your hand. All right, so nobody disagrees. F does come first in the alphabet. So let me erase that and write it in the right order. So F and then P is our least common denominator. Now we're going to multiply on the left side each part by the least common denominator. So this one by FP, this one by FP, and also the top by FP. All right, let's rewrite this now in the numerator. Nothing really cancels out, so it's just one time FP. And then in the denominator, now we have a FP on top and an F in the bottom. This is all multiplication, so I actually am able to just cancel out one little piece. The F and the F is the same and I'm left with P times 1, which is just P. And then over here, the same, FP, and we have a P in the bottom. We can just cancel out the P because all these are multiplied. So we are left with minus F. And our Q is by itself on the right side, but we can always rewrite it with the Q first. And then what Q is. So this problem had a couple of steps involved, but like I said, the goal is to get Q by itself and you should apply what you have learned about fractions, about complex fractions, about anything to make it happen that Q is in the numerator and by itself. Okay, so no questions. Then let's move on to problem number 11.
So we have a word problem. This one says solve the application. And it states that a painter can finish painting a house in eight hours. Her assistant takes 10 hours to finish the same job. How long would it take for them to complete the job if they were working together? So with word problems, you should always try to come up with an equation that you are able to solve using the information that you are given. And in this case, we are given that one painter did it in 8 hours and the other one in 10 hours and both of them together and we are looking for in how much time they did it if both of them were working together. So I like to set up this equation and there are different methods but I like to set it up that I don't know the part that it would take the first person to paint the house if they were working together but I know if they work by themselves it would take them eight hours but if I add the assistant and I don't know how long it would take him to um, if he does it with the first painter but I know if he's working by himself it would take him 10 hours and all that is equal to one job both of them are doing one job together so now I got my equation and I basically have to solve for x because that will give me the uh, amount or the hours that it would take them if they were working together. So these are two fractions. When we are adding fractions, we need the same common denominator. In this case, the least common denominator um, I don't know um, if you guys know the least common denominator when you're given two different numbers, but I have a little method that I'm using when I have two different numbers. I'm basically listing the prime factors, and the prime factors of 8 are 2 times 2 times 2, and then the prime factors of 10 are 2 times, not 2 times 2, 2 times 5. Okay, once you found the prime factors, if they have anything in common, mark it, and for your least common denominator, you only have to take that piece once. So in this case, they both share a 2, so I only grab it once, but then I'm going to have to grab all the individual pieces. So I'm still having a 2, another 2, and then a 5. If I multiply all these back together, I'm getting my least common denominator, which in this case is 40. So this is a method how to find the least common denominator if you're dealing with numbers. So to get to 40, the first fraction, we have to multiply by 5, top and bottom. And the second fraction, to get to 40, we have to multiply by 4, top and bottom. Okay, now rewriting this, we get 5x over 40 plus 4x over 40 and that is equal to 1. I just realized that if you don't like the fractions, you could have also used the method we were using previously of uh, clearing the fractions, and that would have meant that you would have to multiply through by 40. So this by 40, this by 40, and this by 40, and that will cancel out the two denominators. But it's not too bad because what happens now in, in my case, I just add the numerators because now the denominators are the same. So 5x plus 4x is 9. And 40 stays the same. On the other side, we have 1. And now solving for x. So to get rid of the 40, we could just multiply by 40 on both sides. And we are left with 9x equals 40 and then dividing by 9, dividing by 9, 
So x equals 40 over 9. In this case, they want you to convert it into a mixed number. But on your review and your test, it's not necessary to convert it into a mixed number. You could leave it as an improper fraction. So let's just, for this particular review, so you can compare with the answers at the back, um, let's convert it to a mixed number. So how many times does a 9 go into 40? It goes in approximately 4 times, and 4 times 9 is 36, so 40 minus 36 leaves me with 4 ninth hours. So on the review and the test, you are required to leave it as an improper fraction, but then they also want you to uh, um, convert it into a decimal and round it to give an approximation, because nobody really knows what means 4 and 4 ninth of an hour. But if you would convert that into a decimal, I don't have my calculator, okay, we can use um, the calculator I have uh, in, uh, on the computer. So if you convert it, you basically just do the division, 40 divided by 9, or help me guys, do 40 divided by 9 and tell me what that is and round to one decimal place. Then I don't have to switch programs. I hope you guys are paying attention. Don't let me hang here. So what is 40 divided by 9? Didn't bring a calculator today. I can do it long division, but that would take a little long. I guess my audience doesn't want to help me. <laughs> Let's give them like a few more seconds. Maybe I just don't see where they're typing it in. If you want to help me, just raise your hand and then and then uh, type the answer. Okay, I see. Now I have some participants here. Okay, we got 4.4. Does anybody else has 4.4? So I'm going to write 4.4 if nobody is complaining. So what she did, thank you by the way, what she did was she divided 40 divided by 9 and that gave her 4.4 probably something else but I told her to round to one decimal place. So 4.4 hours, at least now we know it would take them uh, about 4 hours if they were doing it together, which is pretty good if one would take eight hours and the other one ten. So basically that's what teamwork can accomplish. You can do it in half the time. Thank you, by the way. Thank you, guys. All right. If there are no questions, let me see. Everybody put their hand down again. Okay. So there are no questions. Then let's move on to 12. Another word problem. <clears throat> So de to determine the number of fish in a lake, a park ranger catches 300 fish, tags them, and returns them to the lake. Later, 144 fish are caught, and it is found that 20 of them are tagged. Estimate the number of fish in the lake. Okay, I noticed I have three values here, 300, 144, and 20. So I feel like this sounds like a proportion. So I'm going to uh, try to write a proportion that I can solve to find this missing value. Basically, they caught 300 fish. So proportion means that I have two fractions that are equal to each other. So they caught 300 fish and they tagged them, which means the 300 are the tagged ones. And then later 144 fish are caught and it is found that 20 of them are tagged. 
So this side would be the original fishes or fish, and this side is the ones they, that they later caught and then how many are tagged. So I started it with the tag on top, then I'm also going to need tag on top on the other side. So I know that the 20 goes here, then because the 144 is part of the, of the fish that they caught later on, so that goes on this side which means I've got only one spot left to put my X. I set up my proportion and now I'm able to use cross multiplication to solve this proportion. So 300 times 144 oops, 144 <clears throat> so that was a little hiccup. Here we go. 144 is equal to 20 times x. And now I'm solving for x, so I can do 300 times 144. Okay, let's see if this time we can get the audience to do it a little bit quicker. So what is 300 times 144? When you finish, raise your hand so I know where to look for your answers. Okay, somebody raised their hand. Let's see. So here we got 43,200. So if you guys agree, let me know if we have another um, answer to check. Yeah, I think we got, everybody got the same answer, and that will be equal to 20. And now the last step is to get x by itself, so divide by 20 on both sides. Again, guys, I'm asking you what is 43,200 divided by 20. Okay, a hand went up. Very nice. Let me see what this person put. Okay, I got 2,160. So if this is correct, I'm counting on the audience here, um, that is equal to x, and x represents the number of fish in the lake. So we have approximately, based on our proportion, 2,160 fish in the lake. That's a lot of fish. So you better catch one at least. Okay, so if there are no questions pertaining this problem, all hands are down, then let's move on to question number 13. Thanks again for your quick response. That helps a lot. Usually, Professor Forsythe is the one with the calculator, so obviously um, <laughs> I messed up today. Uh, moving on to question 13. Simplify the radical expression. So we have the cube root of negative 343. First of all, we should pay attention whenever we have a negative number under the root if the index is odd, we only are able to get a real solution for a number that is a root if the index is odd. So we good. We can attempt to solve this problem. So now we need to find a number that we can multiply three times together to give us negative 343. And this number has to be negative, because that's the only way that we will get a negative number under the cube root. So I'm going to try if my audience is able to figure that out. I do know this number, but I just want to see how easy or how hard it is for you to find a cube root of something. You could use your calculator to find this answer if you know 
what is the button for cube root because that's a different one than the one for square root. So let's see. Let's give him a few seconds because I know it's a little bit difficult to find that that option on the on the calculator. Okay. Nobody has raised their hand yet. So I guess this question is difficult. Let me know if you guys want me to show you on the calculator where that button is. Okay, also no response. All right, so I know that this number is negative 7 because negative 7 times negative 7 times negative 7 is negative 343. If you don't believe me, type that into the calculator. I know that negative 7 times negative 7 is definitely 49. And then 49 times negative 7. should equal negative 343. So therefore the cube root of negative 343 is negative 7. Okay, so if there are no questions let me see if anybody typed something. No. If there are no questions, then I'm moving on to number 14. Unless you guys want me to show you on the calculator to find the cube root of a number or a higher root of a number. Okay, nobody. Then let's move on to number 14. This one says convert the number to scientific notation. So we are given a number and we have to write it into scientific notation. Usually a lot of professors, if you have taken a math class before, are trying to tell you guys about uh, moving to the left is negative and right is positive or something like that. That is very confusing to me the way that I remember if the exponent of the 10 is positive or negative is by asking myself is this a big number? Is this something that I would like on my bank account? Yes, of course. So if it's something that I like to have on my bank account because it's a big number then the exponent should be positive. And if it's something really small, like 0 0.0000 something that I don't want to have on my bank account, then that should have a negative exponent. So let's show what I mean by that. First of all, the rule is that you only have one number in front of the decimal. So having one number, the decimal goes right here and then putting the rest of the numbers. Do not put the zeros, only numbers. So that will be 2.2. .2. And I mean by that, for example, if you have 202, two, then this zero should still count. So you should go with your decimal until there's no more numbers and the rest is zero, then you just stop. So in this case, meaning only one number outside will be 202. Two. But this is just on, on the side example. So in our case, so one number outside, 2.2, two, and then times 10. So now I have to decide if it's a positive or negative exponent and in this case big number something I want on my bank account so it's a positive exponent but then by how many. So right now the decimal would be here and I decided one number outside it needs to move here and I'm moving one, two, three, four, five, six. So positive exponent positive six. Okay, this problem is not very hard if you can remember. Only one digit in front of the decimal. 
and positive exponent if you have a big number, negative exponent if you have a really small number. Moving on to question 15. Okay, question 15 says, use radical notation to evaluate the expression and simplify if possible. So we have negative 64 raised to 4 thirds. First of all, let's write it into radical notation, which means that the denominator of this exponent becomes the index. Right there. And then negative 64 raised to the fourth power. Okay, so now So now I'm going to fix this a little bit because you guys remember the rule if the index and the power are the same then the radical and the power cancel each other out and the number just comes out. So but this right now is 4 so I'm going to fix it that there's going to be at least 1 3. So let me rewrite this problem and I'm going to split the 64 into 3 and then I would have 1 negative 64 left over because this is multiplication and there's an imaginary 1 so when you are multiplying what you do with the exponents you add them so 3 plus 1 is 4 this is still the same as this I just split it so it looks nicer and now I can apply my rule of having the index and the power the same. So as you can see I split it even further, I'm allowed to do that, that's still the same and now I can cancel out the first one and what is left is negative 64. Okay, the second one now Um, I'm missing the 6. Okay, here we go. Negative 64. Nobody noticed? Okay. This is what it's supposed to say. I just lost it. So now we have to try to do this individually. So cube root of negative 64, you can try to plug this into the calculator. Let's try this again like before. Or try to find a number that is multiplied three times by itself to give you negative 64. Can you tell me what this number is that gives you negative 64? I know for sure it is negative. Remember only if you have an odd index you're allowed to have a negative number under the radical to be able to get a real number as a solution. Later on, we will be dealing with imaginary numbers. Okay, somebody responded. Let me see. Negative 4. Yay. Okay. Finally, it works. Yay. Okay, negative 4. And that is correct because negative 4 times negative 4 times negative 4 is negative 64. So right here, simplifying this part, I am getting negative 4 out of there. Last step would be to just multiply these two together. And doing that, let me see if my audience is still with me. What do you get if you multiply for negative or negative 64 times negative 4? You got a positive, I can tell you that much. And that is Yay, somebody else. Good, good, good. 200, everybody got the right answer. Very nice. I hope you guys get that problem correct on your test. So the, the final answer, when you multiply these together, you get a positive 256. Good, perfect. Okay, so if there are no questions, let me check and put the hands down. So if there are no questions,
raise your hand if you have a question. If there are no questions, then we are going to move on to number 16. Here we go, 16. Multiply and then simplify the radical expression if possible. So here we have two binomials and that looks pretty much like foiling. So I'm going to use foiling to get rid of those sets of parentheses. So I'm going to start with first times first and because I don't want to do 11 times 11 even though I know what is 11 times 11, I can also write it like this because it's twice. I'm multiplying the same thing twice, right? And then the first times the last, I get 5 with square root of 11. I cannot combine them, but they are multiplied. Then the second times the first, I get plus 5 square root 11. And then second times last, I get negative 25. So now you see these are exact opposites. They cancel each other out. It's zero. And then over here, even if you don't see it, but it has an index of 2. That is given. If you're dealing with square roots, they have an index of 2. And now you might see that the index and the power cancel each other out. So I'm left with just 11. You could have done the square root of 11 times the square root of 11 and could have gotten 121 and then just take the square root which is 11. You could have done that but sometimes you might happen with a number that you don't know um, on the top of your head what that number is. So this method might be easier knowing that it cancels each other out and you're just left with that very same number from the beginning. So 11 minus 25, our final answer should be negative 14. Okay, no questions so far. I'm going to 17. I think we are going to be able to finish before two hours. So 17 says rationalize the denominator and simplify. Rationalizing the denominator means that in, your, in our final answer we are not allowed to have any more square roots or any type of roots in the denominator of the fraction. To do that we're using the method of rationalizing and that means we multiplying top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator. The conjugate is nothing else than the opposite so the only thing that changes is the sign and the numbers stay the same. We have to do that to uh, top and bottom to keep the value of the fraction the same. But now what should happen is that we're eliminating the square root in the denominator. So let's first simplify the top by distributing the 5. 5 times 8 is 40 and 5 times square root of 10 is just 5 with the square root of 10. And now the denominator, so 8 times 8 is 64, we use foiling, 8 times positive square root of 10 is 8 with the square root of 10, then second times first is negative 8 with the square root of 10, and negative 10 times a positive 10, so I can do the same thing like I did before, and then uh, I know that this and this cancel out, so it's just negative 10. The middle term, their opposites cancel out. So all I got, let me just copy down my numerator. All I got in the denominator is a 64 and minus 10. Rationalizing the denominator and multiplying by the conjugate will always give you 
this and just this so if you wanted to use a shortcut just skip the two middle terms because you know they they are going to cancel each other out but if you're not sure of what you're doing just make sure you write it out to uh, see that there is no mistake all right but anyway we are not done because we can simplify even further in the denominator because we can solve 64 minus 10 so our final answer should be 40 plus 5 square root of 10 over 54 so this is a good answer sometimes you might have to simplify further but that only happens if these three numbers share a common factor but in this case they do not share a common factor so leaving that as is is totally okay as a answer for this problem in your review and on your t on your test you are going to have this problem in this version that it says your answer has to be written in the form a plus square root of b over c and then you are going to type in what your a is so in your case a is 40 what is your b and there's a little note that's saying if you have something outside the square root put it with a comma so your b would be a 5 comma 10 and then your c in this case is 54 so just making sure that you guys have no questions on the review or test of how to type in answers and getting full points there is no time to lose any points okay moving on to question 18 which says solve the radical equation and check your solution solutions so that implies that it could have one but it could have more than one so let's see and solving this the first step would be getting the radical all by itself here's the radical so first step let's get it all by itself by moving the 6 over to the other side so let's add 6 to both sides and we are left with the cube root of 5x plus 2 is equal to positive 3 now the the radical is by itself and we can apply the squaring or cubing or whatever the index is by both sides to get rid of this radical so in this case the index is 3 so we're gonna cube both sides now here the radical and the power will go away and we are left with 5x plus 2 and on the right side we have 3 raised to the power of 3 so 3 times 3 times 3 should be 27 okay solving for x so subtract 2 5x equals 25 divide by 5 from both sides and x equals 5 so because it says check we should check then this is another problem where you could have an extraneous answer which is not a valid solution so just to make sure let's go back into the original problem and plug in 5 for x so the cube root of 5 times x in this case 5 plus 2 minus 6 is equal to negative 3 remember when you are checking you are not supposed to move everything across the equal sign just solve each side separately and then compare if you got a true statement so we're just staying on this side 
let's solve under the radical, so 5 times 5 is 25 plus 2, and then on the right side we just have negative 3. 25 plus 2 is 27 minus 6 is equal to negative 3. The cube root of 27 is 3 minus 6 is negative 3. And 3 minus 6 is negative 3, which is equal to negative 3. So I get a true statement, which means this solution is valid. Okay, I don't see hands up, which means no questions. So moving on, number 19. One more word problem. So solve this application and if necessary round to the nearest tenth. Okay, just reminding myself that whatever answer we get. And it says, a building has a ramp to its front door, doors to accommodate the handicapped. If the distance from the building to the end of the ramp is 12 feet and the height from the ground to the front doors is 8 feet, how long is the ramp? I am a very visual person, so I'm going to just draw myself a little ramp. So this would be the ramp for the handicap to enter this building. And then I'm going to put the information where it's supposed to go. So it says uh, the ramp is 12 feet from the building to the end, so the building goes all the way to the bottom, by the way, it's not in the air. <clears throat> so from the building to the end, that is 12 feet. And then uh, it says from the ground to the front doors is 8 feet. So from the ground to the doors, here are the little doors, is 8 feet. And we are looking for how long this ramp is. So that is x. We are looking for x. So now visualizing it, I see this is a right triangle and when I have a right triangle I can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for a missing side. So the Pythagorean theorem is c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared where c squared is always the hypotenuse and the hypotenuse is the side that is across the 90 degree angle, in this case this is the longest side of a right triangle and then a and b are variable so it doesn't matter if you use 8 or 12 for each one of them that should not change your answer but the hypotenuse, the c, is important that that will be a the longest side or the side across the 90 degree angle. So we are looking for C in our case. A and B are our choice, so I'm going to start with the 8 squared and then plus B, which in this case is 12 squared. And now I'm solving for C. So 8 times 8 is 64 and then 12 times 12 is 144 still solving for C. 64 plus 144 gives me 208. And now I want C by itself, but I have a little squared on there. So uh, to get rid of the squared, I can use the square root method. So square rooting both sides, but if I do that, I will get a positive and negative answer. And that has just something to do with the possibilities of taking square roots or squaring, so I need to consider both. But in this case, because it's a real-world problem, I know that I can disregard the negative answer because the ramp definitely not going to be negative feet long. So I'm going to focus on the positive answer, but now the square root and the square cancel each other out because the index is 2. So finally, C is by itself, and the square root of 208 I hope you guys are still with me because I need your help. But you guys know what? This time, because 
I really, really wanted to show you how to use the calculator. You can do it for me, but I'm going to just show possibly the people that will be watching later how to do this on the, on the calculator. Uh, I want to change screen, switch programs. So we're looking for the square root of 208. So there's my calculator. And the square root symbol is right here in blue. So I'm going to have to hit the blue button first and then the x squared to get my square root symbol. And then I can type in 208. I don't really need to close it if I don't have any other operations, the parentheses. It will still give me a valid answer. I only need to close it if I got more stuff that I want to calculate in one step. But here we have 14.42 and so forth. It said round to the nearest tenth. So that means one decimal place. And this two tells me that four stays the same. So our answer should be 14.4. Before I go back, I'm just going to show you guys real quick where is the cube root. So the cube root, when you hit math, you see right here on the number four that it says cube root. So if you wanted to calculate a cube root, you would press math and then 4, and then whatever you're trying to find a cube root of, for example, we did 27 before, and we said it was 3, so this should be 3, and that's correct. If you have a higher root, you should type the index first, so let's say we are dealing with a fourth root, the index is 4, and then we hit math, and under number 5, now I should know a perfect fourth root. I think 64 is a perfect fourth root. So we could try 64. And, okay, that didn't work out. Um, I guess 64 is not a perfect fourth root. But that's how you do higher index roots. So in our particular case, we were looking for 14.4, which was rounded to the nearest tenths. So now let's go back to our um, PowerPoint, 14.4 is the answer, and we are dealing with units, so it should be feet. The ramp is 14.4 feet long. Fourteen point four. yes, somebody did go and find the answer. Thank you. Okay, if we have no questions, let me see, no questions, then we are going to move on to our very last question for this session, which is question number 20, and it says perform the indicated operation and simplify if possible. So we are supposed to add, but we can only add if we have like terms. In this case, they are not alike. This one has an x outside, this one doesn't. This one has x cubed, and this one doesn't. So they are not alike. As of right now, we cannot combine them, but we could try to simplify them first and see then if we got like terms. So let's simplify this first radical, and I'm going to split it into perfect and non-perfect radical parts. So 6, 6 is a non-perfect number, 6 does not have two factors where one of them is a perfect square, so it goes in my non-perfects, but then x cubed, I can split that and make at least part of the x cubed perfect, because the perfect part would be x squared, and then I would have one x left, because x squared times another x will give me the x cubed. Then my second part, I can also split that into perfect and non-perfect square roots in this case. And in this case, the 54 does have a factor, which is a perfect square, because 9. 
and 9 times 6 is 54. So I split it into perfect and non-perfect. And then the x, which has an imaginary exponent of 1, that is non-perfect because the index is 2 and the power needs to be divisible by 2, but in this case it's less than 2, so definitely not perfect. And now I, I'm finished separating and I can take the actual perfect square roots. So the square root of x squared is x, and then I have my non-perfect, which is x, uh, 6x, and here I had already an x outside, so that comes down, and then I can take the square root of 9, that was my perfect, so 9, because this is multiplication, so whatever comes out also needs to be multiplied, and I'm left with my non-perfect part, which is 6x. Okay, I'm just going to rewrite it real quick because mathematically the number should go first and then the variable. So a lot of math people have like OCD and it just, you know, doesn't look right. So now it looks right and now they are like terms because they have the same variables outside, x and x. They have the same radicals which are square roots, and they have the same radicand, which is 6x. So we good, now we finally can combine these two. They are like terms. Here is an imaginary one, so all we do is we just add the coefficients, so 1 plus 9. Oops, why nobody is stopping me? Nobody is having the hand up. <coughs> Yeah, there's a hand. Okay, let me see what she says because I made a mistake. Okay, she didn't see nothing yet, but I guess she tried to get my attention to tell me that there is something wrong. <laughs> let me give her a second to figure out what is wrong because <laughs> I noticed. Yes, yes, you're right. Right here. The square root of 9 is not 9. The square root of 9 is 3. So, on the last question, I needed to mess up. Man, that's what I get if Professor Forsythe is not here to let me know. All right, so square root of 9 is 3, so there should have been a 3. And now we're adding 1 plus 3, which is 4, and the rest stays all the same. So thank you for noticing. You saved my life because I would have gotten a lot of emails. <laughs> okay, so 4x square root of 6x is the final answer for question number 20. Okay, be before I'm going to turn off the recording, I just want to go to the next slide to just remind you about... Uh, the uh, um, test. So here's test 3 information and the test actually opened today and is open until oops what does that supposed to mean? <laughs> okay so it's April 4 there's no 9 there. <laughs> okay 2016 and it will be open which is next Monday it will be open until 7 p.m. Uh, I actually changed that until 8, but please do not wait until the last minute. I had a student, I think on the last test, I went there probably at 7.01 and wasn't able to get in. So anyway, make sure you are there before that. Give yourself enough time because the test is two hours, so you should be able to take the two hours you are set up at your preferred testing center again so you are responsible to find out their hours of operation they may differ from the Osceola campus but right down here I put the Osceola campus testing center hours so anytime in between those and days before next Monday you are um, able to take test number three you are allowed to bring your graphing calculator. The version 
TI-83 or TI-84, you are not to bring anything above that. No Inspire, no other fancy calculators, only these two. Make sure you have your pencils or whatever you prefer to write. Scratch paper will be provided from the testing center. Bring your VID or photo ID. Some of them only take VIDs, but I know other testing centers might substitute with a driver's license or something with a picture on it. This CRN, they might ask you for it. For this course is 24944. The course ID is MAT1033C. Every single intermediate algebra course has the same, but this one is a number that's very important and unique to your class. And then if they ask you for the instructor, it's either my name or Professor Forsythe name. Do not let them send you away. They do have the information. I already submitted referrals. So have them double check or call me or Professor Forsythe. Okay, so if there are no questions, I'm going to turn off the recording, but I still will be available online if anybody wants to communicate with me. If you have a uh, microphone, I can unmute you if you want. You can put it into the text box and it will, I will unmute you if you wanted to ask your question in person, or you could just type it into the text box. So for everybody else that will be watching the session later, I wish you guys good luck on test three. The review will be up today. I am finishing the last question. It will be up today, I promise. Again, try to get ADO above to qualify for the extra credit. And if you have any questions or concerns, email me. I will be available and trying to respond as quickly as possible. So for the ones that want to hang out and ask questions, please stay online.